It's four years now since the Bainbridges left this house. It's 1,500 feet up, seven miles from a proper road. They'd lived here 17 years, brought up three children, but one savage winter defeated them. This winter they're returning, just the two of them. The Bainbridges don't even own the farm. They never did. And the time-honoured deal with the landlord says they have to take and care for 200 of his sheep along with their own flock. It's a gamble Brian Bainbridge has won and lost before. Now he's gambling on the winters staying mild enough to let him build up his stock. Well, I should manage all right the long time to go yet, like. Uh, snowstorms. Do you think you're going to have a bad winter? Well, we deal for one. We've had a good one or two. for the small community the Bainbridges have rejoined, this winter came early, November the 12th. Leave the A1 at Scotch Corner, then head for Barnard Castle. Travel ten more miles up the valley of the Tees and you come to a different land. It has a frontier which is clearly and icily defined. Upper Teesdale is a bleak land, still inhabited by a few men and women who work the remote farms, living a life as harsh and unremitting as ever it was. Life which the Bainbridges, Mary and Brian, have accepted again. But Birkdale and the high tops are relentless. The blizzard came within hours, filling in the roads and the fields with five-foot drifts. They bow to the ritual they remember only too well. The fight is on again.
It's the dog that counts. A good dog can smell the sheep buried under the snow, but the man must know where to send him. You know where they've been sheltering, which way the wind's been blowing, you know, and they're going for shelter. And uh, sort of look around that area first. How do you know you've actually got some missing? Well, it's it's tuppen time now, what we call tuppen time, and we, we count them sort of every day, and I knew there was half a dozen of them this morning. It's mostly hogs, it's a missing this time of year. This is a hog, this year's lamb, you see. How many have you ever lost? What's the worst lot? Well, there's a hell of a storm, 63. We lost, we lost 350 here. It's just too long a winter for them. Not buried by snow, just too long a winter for them. What made you want to come back to this farm after this time? Oh, I like, I like the hills, I like swale day the sheep, I like the moors. You can let yourself rip up here, no way to bother you. Brian Bainbridge will go on clawing at snowdrifts until dark. There are another five sheep still to be accounted for. And further up the fell, his neighbours have their own problems. They run 2,000 sheep up there, across five miles of the high Pennines, cared for by one full-time shepherd. Now he's called for help to bring them down to the shelter of the valley.
The last of the stragglers is brought in by the dogs. The deep snow's behind them. It's been a long day already, but there's no easier way, even for an old professional, like George Horne. Well, you just have to keep going around them, shepherding them, uh, gathering them up and into uh, different lots, you know. Now, while the sheep are back down in the farm, are you paid for them at all? Oh, no, 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 no. So what happens to your wages now? I'll just have to live on my means off the bit farm I have, like. And the money can't be all that great. What's the attraction for it for you? Well, I don't know. It's just a living, that's all. I can't say there's any attraction to, to it, like. The house at Birkdale's damp. The plaster is crumbling. But at least this time, there's only the memory of worse problems, like illness and children needing a doctor. Um, well, we just used to take them down to Lanton Beck, we're on horseback, or carry them, and uh, horse and cart, and take them down that way. But as for the doctor coming here, he's only here twice when I was, uh, when I was little. But I think... A mother gets an instinct about her child, you know, you get this feeling. I doctored them a lot more than a town, somebody in a town would do. I mean, I had the measles and chicken pox and the whooping cough. Mine, I had them along with them. But, uh, you know, I had them all and they, we didn't bother the doctors and they just got over them. They just sort of looked after them. I had an idea what to do. And I was lucky. I always had them, three of them, I always had them together. And as I say, I had them with them. So, uh, Brian mainly had them to look after. What's the attraction for you for this particular farm? Um, well, I don't know, I can't really explain about it. It's just something that... I just love it. I just love the hills and the sheep and the loneliness and... You know, it's something that nobody can explain unless they've lived here. There are other women who can understand. Low Burke Hat Farm is just over the fell in Baldersdale. It's been Hannah Hawkswell's home since she was three years old. Today, she farms its 80 acres alone. It's all right. Thank you, will mummy? Ah, dear little beast. Oh, oh, oh. oh, you little beast. The bullock's for sale. Another neighbour two miles away will get it the rest of the way to market.
Anna Hawkswell's bullet goes to market. It's a very important annual event for Hannah. The outcome will affect the contents of this parcel for the whole winter. But Hannah doesn't go to market. It's no place for a maiden lady. The parcel contains her food for the month. It's left on the wall by the gate on the road one and a half miles away from Low Burkhat Farm. Butter, cheese, eggs, tea, sugar, lard, margarine, onions, carrots, bread, tomatoes, and one tin of spam. The bill, five pounds, 36 pence. She collects extra bread the same way once a week. Once a year, the man who does the haymaking brings Hannah two chickens. On her 80 acres, she copes with one milking cow and two calves, plus a few cattle she takes in from neighboring farms. Anna Hawkswell was left on her own when her mother, the last of her family, died 12 years ago. In the house, there's no electricity, no water on tap. When she wants a cup of tea, she has to go to the stream in the field where the cattle graze. Eight to base, ninety-eight, hundred base, hundred pounds, hundred two, hundred two, two 
to a page. 102 and bait come along and 102 found the page. The Drake Bullock 3. 103, 3 and bait. 103 and bait. 4, 104, 5, 105, 5 and bait. 6 and bait. 106, 6 and half and 7. 107 bait. 107 pounds come another. And 174 said 8. Is that right? 107. You're out. That's the bit only 6 against you. 107. You're out. I want to be clear about 8. 108. 8 bait. 108. 8 and bait. 108 bait. And 108. Your turn. 108 pounds. Better at least than last year. Uh, the last beast I sold, he... he made 98 in the auction mart. Of course, there are exes, transport and so forth. Well, how, how, how much money do you get in a year? I think round about 250, 280 mark, somewhere in there. I take cattle in uh, from other people and I uh, try to have a beast of my own to sell and, and then one gets the subsidies from, from the cow and, and the calves. There's usually one calf, but I, I have two this time. Well, out of that £280, what, what sort of things do you have to pay out? Uh, the meal, that's a, a fairly big thing. Uh, this, the, the hay timing, of course, one, and um, the groceries, the coals. The, the coals are a rather an expensive item. How much is that? But I like, well, I think over thirty pounds, I think. And uh, but I like a fire. There's one thing I've never, I have never economised on. I like a good fire. It's essential. I think I have a system of uh, uh, of keeping expenditure down to the bare, the very bare necessities. In some, I wouldn't say that I really, in some respects, that I can even afford n uh, some necessities, but I keep it down to the the bare essentials. I put the brake on and and keep it on. About, it's the only way. What about food? Well, food, it's, I, I sort of, it's like the other things, I, I just sort of try to economise. Well, what, what did you have for your lunch today? Butter and bread. Well, what really keeps you here? What's the time? Attached to the place because my family have lived here since my great-grandfather's time. No one else has lived in this house since it was built but our family. And uh, the lovely countryside uh, down the new, through the Iron Gate down the new road. And um, I, I've often thought sometimes it's my favourite walk. And I've stopped and looked and, and I've thought, well... It's one thing, I, if I haven't money in my pocket, it's one thing nobody can rob me of. Uh, nobody can... It's mine. It's mine for the taking. I was born in the Dale at Sleetburn. Um, I can see it from here. And uh, uh, father and mother and other members of the family came to live here when I was three. And. Uh, Till I don't remember any other home. What happened the time you were ill, Hannah? Well, I think I'd got rather down in myself and... I'd been to the doctor, going to see the doctor for quite a while and he thought I wasn't improving very much and so he suggested I went to hospital. And I was there for eight weeks, I think. Was that the first time you'd spend any length of time away from here? Oh, yes, it was. I've never spent any time away since. How did you like it? Oh, I... 
Of course, I did. I hadn't anything seriously long, wrong, and uh, everybody was very kind to me. Uh, I was very happy there. Made friends. I, I went to stranger. I knew no one, and I came back. I made one or two friends. But it didn't make you feel that you wanted to be somewhere where there were people all the time in the future, did it? Uh, I, I took rather badly with it when I c came back. Uh, but, uh, of course, I gradually got used to the same thing again. But, oh, it, it wasn't the same when I came home at first. Uh, seemed very quiet and no one to talk to. During winter, Hannah can go for ten days without seeing another soul. She's 46. There's never been a man in her life. No real prospect of marriage. Well, uh, that's something that one can't just choose to do. A good marriage is a good thing if one's privileged to meet anyone. Um, I think there's all the difference in the world between a good marriage and being on one's own. But of course, about, if it isn't a success, well, that's, there's not, I think there can be nothing worse than being obliged to share a roof with someone you're um, utterly at variance with. That's dreadful, terrible. Um, but that's something, uh, it's in other hands, you can't choose. One can't go into a shop and say, I want a husband. I'm reminded of a very interesting article I read in, the, in a Dalesman. Uh, I think someone very like me mentioned to her clergyman uh, this question of uh, not finding a husband. And um, he said, oh, leave the matter in the Lord's hands. And she replied, that's all very well, but up to now he's, the Lord's mad badly out. <laughs> I think that's it. I leave it at that. Further down the valley, an important annual event is being organised, rather late for England. Mrs Olive Field is almost ready for her harvest home. There's a man coming from Richmond, is he? When? For the harvest festival. Oh yes, two of them. Oh yeah. Mrs Field has the big house in Teesdale. She's the widow of Norman Field, a grandson of Marshall Field, who founded the famous Chicago department store. He was, of course, the master of the local hunt. They had an ocean-going yacht. We hope it's better weather than every day. Oh, it's bloody. Terrible, I think. Oh, my God. Oh, don't go too far, Shoot. But that was in the past. Mrs. Field is 86 now and crippled. She lives with her secretary, maid, butler, chauffeur, housekeeper and gardeners in the fading glory of Lartington Hall. This is where she combines America's Thanksgiving Day and Teasdale's Harvest Home, all under one roof. A canon and a vicar take the service in the private chapel. The fires are lit in the ballroom for the supper and villagers, tenants and the hill farmers are invited. I like Charlie the Flower. I think it's about time we're going to chapel, madam. Is it? Yes. Oh, the hell. <gasps> I haven't got to go down the stairs, have I? No, oh, no. go straight up. I'll have to put it for my kind of chair. Hey, the lady. Bad the old lady. Yes, sure. It'll be so quick. Yes, almost. I must get her to get a good seat. No good seats for me then. Oh, yes, your seat's there, ready, waiting. I can't go, I can't climb up. Well, we'll get you there in time. Oh!
two faces are missing from the congregation. The Bainbridges have other things to do. Brethren, let us kneel in silence and remember God's presence with us now. Let us humbly confess our sins before God, almighty and most merciful Father. We have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy doors. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Hymn number 379, 379. <clears throat> O Lord, this food to our use and relieve the wants of others for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen.
This is the first one this year, is it, Brian? Yes, sir. And only November. An unnerving echo of that killing winter. That was 1963. Well, in the morning, we had to sometimes dig our way out, you know, tunnel out. And uh, make way also a tunnel for the cattle. Get them water. We had no water balls. And, and uh, about 40 foot of snow, you had to dig a tunnel down, take them down one at a time. And, and back them out. And you have to dig again next morning because it was always filled up again. What was the worst part of that winter? Um, I think it was the end of winter, come to spring, when you went around lamb and you'd lost all them sheep and there was no lambs about. It's, you sort of felt empty. One of the days, I think, it, it, isn't, a, it isn't a good memory, but we, we often laugh about it now. I mean, my neighbour. We were buried about 350 in one hall. We were having a job to get them in, you know, podging them down with our feet. There's one old last year, he's up on top, you know, pulling them down. My neighbour says, he says, he says, look up Brian, he says, he's just like devil, that one on top of the grave. We had a bit of a laugh, you know. Teasdale can be a brutal land. but it has an inspirational beauty for those who live there. We had poets in Teasdale, Richard Watson and um, uh, William Longstaff at Mickleton, and uh, who wrote many nice poems. The, the lines of some these lines, particularly from one of his, I like very much. Lone silent hills, clear singing streams, among them we near to God. Those lines appeal to me very much. The my life, that's my picture I see every day and never tired of it. Have you ever thought of leaving the Dale? Well, I don't know. The time. I think the time might come uh, when I can't stay here. But uh, as long as I can, uh, I would like. I'm very much attached to the place. It's home. Um, as long as I can, I think the old house and me will stay together. <laughs> <laughs> 